In my last video, I had you guys spot as many design flaws as you could in this very poorly designed sheet metal part. At the end, I walked through each mistake and showed how to fix them by applying design for manufacture or DFM principles. One of the biggest requests I got from you guys was if I can turn this into a series for other manufacturing processes. I'm glad you asked because in this video, I'm going to do the exact same thing and I've made some improvements from the last video based on your feedback. I'll give you a part, but this time for CNC machining, and your job is to identify all the design flaws that would impact machining time, cost, what features can't or can't be made, and just improve the overall design. Mechanical engineers tend to focus solely on functionality, but what's the point if they can't be efficiently manufactured or assembled? All of these constraints need to be satisfied in order for a product to be successful. Successful. That's why companies want to hire engineers who can not only design, but design things on time within budget and to specifications. There's also a game changing tool, Jigga.io, that has totally changed the way I design and make parts that I'm excited to share with you. So let's get started. So this is the CNC part. I want you to take a minute to look at. Pause the video. Think how you would redesign it. The part itself seems simple. It's just a block with some tapped holes. But if you dig deeper, you'll notice a lot of problems that would honestly frustrate a machinist. If you have CAD software, you can also download the CAD model through the link in the description below. Before you start, let's make some assumptions. Assume the material is aluminum 661 and the shop that's fabricating this part only has three axis CNC milling machines. This is a sensor block for race cars that can mount to any engine cylinder block via these two universal mounting holes where engineers need to monitor engine oil, transmission fluid or fluid pressure and temperature from multiple systems in a compact machine housing. It has four sets of tap holes, meaning you can monitor four separate parameters. Each set contains three holes and is quote unquote a circuit with one input and two outputs. You can attach some type of pressure or temperature transducer like this one. All right, without further do let's begin remember not to cheat and best of luck 2000 years later before doing a deep dive into the issues i think it's important to first provide a quick refresher on cnc machining go ahead and skip this part if you're already familiar with the process cnc stands for computer numerical control it's a subtractive manufacturing process where a material is removed from a solid block using cutting tools that follow program paths cnc machines are precise repeatable and ideal for for making parts with tight tolerances. There are a few main types of CNC machines. The most common are CNC lathes, where the part spins while the tool cuts. They're ideal for fabricating cylindrical parts like shafts or bushings. Then there's CNC milling machines, which is the focus of this video. There's three axis machines, which is the most common. The tool moves in X, Y, and Z while the part stays fixed. Three axis machines are great for flat and prismatic parts, but are limited when you need to reach around complex features. Four axis machines add rotation around one axis, typically rotating the part to access different faces. They're quite useful for making features on multiple sides without having to refixture the workpiece. Five axis CNC machines are the most advanced and allow the tool to tilt and rotate while cutting, enabling complex geometries, undercuts, and curved surfaces in a single setup. It's powerful, but more expensive expensive and harder to program. Remember, CNC machining is generally not the first choice for high volume production due to higher costs per part compared to other processes like injection molding, casting, and stamping. There are of course exceptions to every rule like Apple who does leverage CNC machining for mass production and has optimized the process for its products. Now we'll use a top down approach for analyzing this part. The first issue is undercuts. This here is an undercut, which is a recessed or sunken feature that cannot be created with standard cutting tools like end mills. Some types of undercuts for CNC machining include T-slot, which embodies a T-shaped cross section and can be created with a T-slot cutter. Second is a dovetail undercut, which has a trapezoidal or dovetail-like shape and can be created with a dovetail cutter that come in a variety of angles. This part here has a dovetail undercut. Now, ideally, it's best to 
eliminate undercuts because they increase machining time, require special tools, and sometimes even four or five axis machines, and hence dramatically increased cost. But sometimes undercuts are needed because they serve a purpose. Perhaps it's a side hole or some type of interlock feature. When undercuts are absolutely necessary, remember to design the angles, width, and height with standard dimensions based on tooling catalogs. Harvey Tool Machinery's Handbook and McMaster Car are all good resources, but in general, the shallower depth the cut, the better. Now, because this undercut is here solely to enhance aesthetics, we can remove it without affecting functionality. Always try to simplify parts because with CNC machining, time equals money. Every extra setup, flip, custom tool, or unnecessary operation adds cost. If you wanted to design, say, a dovetail undercut for mechanical interlocking, just go on Harvey Tools and reference their dovetail cutter catalog. Remember, at the end of the day, even if you follow standard dimensions, the machine shop might not have that specific cutter on hand, so always get feedback from your manufacturer first. Now, before we talk about the remaining design flaws, I just want to emphasize here that no matter what it is you're designing, sourcing custom parts, whether for personal, school, or work-related projects, presents all kinds of challenges. Engineering projects often face very tight deadlines and finding the right supplier or manufacturer to make quality affordable parts fast and provide timely feedback is nearly impossible. That's why I highly recommend you to try out Jiga.io who is very kindly sponsoring this part of the video. Jiga is a unique custom parts manufacturing platform that connects you with a vast network of vetted suppliers allowing you to directly communicate your requirements to them. This means you get parts faster, cheaper, and made exactly the way you want. With Jiga, you get to build relationship with suppliers, which not only makes the process more reliable, but also simplifies even the most intricate projects. Whether you need prototype or production parts, Jiga can do it all with its CNC machining, sheet metal, 3D printing, and plastic injection molding capabilities. Their platform is insanely user-friendly. All you need to do is upload your parts and Jiga will provide a quote within hours from multiple suppliers, allowing you to compare prices and lead times to get the best deal possible. What's even better is Jiga's service is fully transparent. You can directly communicate with the supplier for DFM feedback on Jiga's website and add notes to the 3D models to let them know your requirements. Recently, I needed a last minute custom part made for a personal project. I simply uploaded my CAD files to Jiga and literally within minutes, I got quotes from three different suppliers and received the parts in under a week. Jiga is also trusted by top tier companies like Google, NASA, and Flex, so you can be sure the quality and on-time delivery of your parts are guaranteed. So if you're looking to simplify and streamline your manufacturing and get parts much faster, definitely check out Jiga.io through the link in the description below. Issue number two is lettering and logos. Avoid raised letters like this in the model at all costs for CNC machining. It will be very time consuming and expensive because it requires tiny end mills and multi-pass operations, especially on small fonts. Recessed letters are the go-to choice for CNC parts and can be created with the CNC machine itself, but more commonly a post-processing method like laser etching or engraving is used for efficiency and cost considerations. For laser engraving, a laser vaporizes a very thin layer of material and can reach a depth of 500 microns on virtually any metal. Pad printing and silk screening are great options as well. Pad printing uses a silicon pad to transfer a 2D image onto a 3D object, even with spherical, cylindrical, textured, concave, and convex surfaces. So let's adjust the text so that it's recessed in the model. Typically to request part marking, usually you'll need to provide a 3D model, a 2D technical drawing, and sometimes a vector file of the font and geometry. Issue number three are non-standard hole sizes. Non-standard hole sizes and thread specifications necessitate additional tooling and setup changes, which can significantly increase machining time and cost. Because we know the function of these 12 holes are to mount sensors and lines for monitoring 
monitoring the pressure and temperatures of various automotive systems in racing, many temperature and pressure sensors utilize a 1 8 MPT thread because they're tapered threads that sail via interference, so there's no need for an O-ring. Instead, they can be installed with thread sealant or PTFE tape. So the diameter of these holes should be 332 thousandths of an inch, which is a drill size for a 1 8 MPT thread. Currently, the diameter of these holes is 27 hundredths of an inch, which is a random size. So let's make them the right size. Keep in mind a 2D drawing must be provided at the quotation stage to fully specify threaded elements and to avoid details being lost. For blind holes, you want to keep the max depth between three to five times the diameter. So these holes should be okay here. For through holes, keep it under 10 times the diameter. Deep holes can cause a lot of problems like tool deflection, breakage, and chatter, which is vibrations from the tool and workpiece moving periodically relative to each other. For threads, go just deep enough for sufficient strength, but not so deep that you're adding additional machining time or risking tool breakage. General guidelines for thread engagement depth is one times the diameter for steel, one and a half times the diameter for aluminum and two times for plastics and soft metals. So for a 1 8 MPT thread, 405 thousandths of an inch of thread depth, which is the major diameter, should be sufficient in terms of strength. The effective thread length for a 1 8 MPT thread is 0.264 inches to create a seal. Because these through holes are not deep, it's going to be faster, cheaper, and more accurate to drill the full depth of these through holes from one side. Remember deep holes will require the workpiece to be flipped, which will risk alignment error unless very carefully fixtured and as setup time. Every time the workpiece is changed to a different orientation, there's an inevitable loss of precision resulting from the need to renew the machine datum. That's the beauty of four and five axis machines because they can make complex features and parts without removing the workpiece. Machine shops will charge higher hourly rates for these than three axis machines, but it can actually reduce overall cost in the long run by avoiding multiple setups and fixturing and total machining time. For these two mounting holes, the diameter is currently 29 hundredths of an inch, which is not a standard size. Let's assume two 5 16 inch bolts need to pass through these holes with a free fit. Then the hole diameter would need to be 332 thousandths of an inch, which is equivalent to a Q drill size. Coincidentally, that's the size of these 12 holes too, which works out perfectly. The next issue is pockets and wall thickness. Now, just like any feature, pockets should only be added if they serve a function because they require extra machining and can be very laborious with small cutters. These pockets were made for the goal of light weighting, which is a terrible thing to do, and there are much better ways. So let's get rid of them. But let's just say we were to keep these here. The pocket depth similar to holes should be three to four times the end mill diameter. So try to keep pockets as shallow as possible. For wall thickness, avoid thin walls, which increase chattering, lowers accuracy, and are prone to distorting. Metal should be at least half a millimeter thick and plastics one millimeter. First off, this section is only 0.37 millimeters and needs to be thickened. Secondly, where part of the wall is unsupported, the depth of the pocket should be at most three to five times the wall thickness. So if the wall thickness is half a millimeter, the depth shouldn't exceed 1.5 millimeters if possible. Of course, this can be improved by slower feeds, reduced cut depths, and faster spindle speeds, which will be more expensive. Money can solve most issues. In every case, ask yourself how thin does the feature actually need to be? And for the love of God, never leave sharp corners and pockets. End mills are round. The machinist will for sure cursor name. For pockets and cavities, the radius should be one third the pocket depth or slightly larger. This allows the tool to cut following a circular path instead of a 90 degree angle. If sharp 90 degree internal corners are required, consider adding a T-bone or dog bone fillet instead of reducing the corner radius. Now we can definitely remove material more strategically like in these areas here if light weighting is truly the goal and still maintaining strength and making the part easier and faster to machine. So let's clean up the part a bit.
The last issue you probably spotted is sharp corners and edges. As engineers, our instinct is probably to add fillets and chamfers to every corner and edge we see in the part model. After all, they're aesthetically pleasing, but believe it or not, fillets and chamfers increase machining time and cost. This is because chamfers require a tool that is at the correct angle, like a countersink chamfer tool or spot drill. Fillets, on the other hand, are created with something like a ball nose end mill and the cutter is programmed to closely follow the part edge and make very small step overs. Including more fillets and chamfers increases the machining time significantly. In the machining environment, time is money. So before you add fillets and chamfers left and right, ask yourself what is the main function of the fillet or chamfer? Is this fillet or chamfer really necessary for the part to function? How cost effective is it to add this feature? for the quantity I'm producing. Generally, chamfers along part edges are much easier and more affordable than fillets because it takes more time to set up a fillet radius tool than a chamfer tool. The machinist has to ensure that it blends with the surfaces that are joined by a fillet. So we can add chamfers instead of fillets to these edges here. However, sometimes fillets like in these areas are needed and that's no problem. We just have to try making them a standard size. We'll go with 5 16 of an inch near these two mounting holes, then 1 8 of an inch at these two corners and 3 16 of an inch at the corners on the back side here. Now the part looks much better. Now I'll end by saying that understanding and estimating how design decisions like adding chamfers and fillets impact machining cost and time takes some practice and experience. Experience. Every CNC machine and machine shop is going to be slightly different and these are just rules of thumb and best practices to follow when you're designing. But at the end of the day, go by what your machine shop or manufacturer tells you. Now the cost implications of early design choices can be significant. It's critically important for the initial design effort to bear in mind any aspects of mass production that can be foreseen and this foresight is actually the key to effective design. Follow simple rules like designing in the largest radius possible, using thicker walls, avoiding non-standard size and deep pockets and holes, choosing chamfers over fillets if possible, and calling out the loosest tolerances possible to deliver function. All right, guys, that's it for today. As always, thank you so much for watching. Let me know in the comments below how many design flaws you spotted, if I missed any, and how many flips you think it would take to make this part on a three-axis CNC milling machine. If you found this video helpful, be sure to check out my video here where I talk about some common design mistakes that even experienced mechanical engineers make. And I'll see you in the next one. Peace.